Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you like this episode, please remember to hit the like button and leave a comment or two. Then subscribe and click on the bell to receive notifications of whenever we release new videos. Also, please remember to share them to your social media. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to the Smoky Range Trailhead, which is accessible off of Canyon Creek Road. This location is in the Flathead National Forest in northwestern Montana, which is a hotbed for grizzly bear attacks. The geography here is forested mountains, which start at a high elevation, then climb to just under 7,200 feet at the top of Standard Peak. The trees here consist mostly of pine, fir, and spruce, but in the valleys, pockets of willow and buckbrush offer shade and shelter to animals. Berry bushes and other bushy plants create a hedge-like barrier for anyone trying to see through them in certain areas. Elk, moose, and white-tailed deer are common sights and are an attractive source of food for human hunters as well as animals who predate upon them. The dominant predators here include cougars, wolves, coyotes, bobcats, as well as black bears and grizzly bears. The small mountain town of Whitefish is under 10 miles from the Smoky Range trailhead as the crow flies. This is close proximity to a grizzly bear that can cover that distance on a single afternoon while searching for food. Late summer is an interesting time for grizzly bears in this area. Summer's heat has stressed plants that the bears feed upon and most berry seasons are in the last weeks of their yields. Food is getting harder to come by for bears, and the added stress of heat and dry conditions force them into cover and shade they would otherwise not search out during cooler, wetter times of the year. This stressor weighs heavier on younger and older bear populations, but particularly hard on sows with growing cubs. Not only do sows need to find enough food for their own survival during hibernation, they must also find enough to ensure the survival of the next generation of grizzly bears. On the afternoon of August 26, 2023, two archery hunters were scouting the Smoky Range trailhead area ahead of their elk hunting trip. For privacy's sake, we'll refer to these hunters as Tim and Rick. Their hunting trip was likely planned during the elk rut, which occurs around the middle of each September. During this time, bull elk are vying for control of harems of cows. The winning bull will be more likely to breed the cows and pass on the strongest genes to the next generation of elk. While competing, bull elks sound a loud, high-pitched scream called a bugle, which echoes for miles through valleys. This is done to locate each other and attract more cows for breeding purposes. This vociferous method of communicating is used by hunters as well as predators to find the location of elk herds. Temperatures on this afternoon peaked at 83 degrees Fahrenheit, which is mild for this time of year. By mid-afternoon, moderate breezes had been blowing through the trees, causing any scent on them to be carried to or away from wary noses monitoring them. Tim and Rick had been scouting the area since early morning and were approaching a thick stand of vegetation. They planned to simply bushwhack their way through it and emerge at another spot with a better view from which to glass for elk. Unbeknownst to the hunters, a sow grizzly and her cub had taken up shelter amongst the cover there, likely dozing off while waiting out the heat of the day. As Tim pushed his way through the tangled brush, he encroached on a very deadly and dangerous boundary. The sow, hidden by the bushes as she and her cub lay in the shade, likely heard them once they were only a few yards from her. Eons of protective survival instinct triggered her to investigate such a close intrusion of her and her cub's location. Rick and Tim were only fifteen feet from the sow grizzly by the time she made herself known to the hunters. She stormed from her resting place in what must have been a very terrifying surprise to the hunters. The men were only a few yards apart from one another, and Tim was slightly behind Rick when they realized the sow was already upon them. The hunters had undoubtedly considered a close proximity encounter with a grizzly as they were armed on their scouting trip. The sources I could find did not indicate anything about the firearms they carried, but it is assumed that they carried pistols, as rifles would have been nearly useless in self-defense against a grizzly in brush at close range. No source I could find indicated that they had packed bear spray with them on their trip. As the angry sow quickly advanced toward the hunters, both of them drew their firearms and began to send hot lead her way. During the confusion and speed of the attack, the sow was struck by several rounds from each man. As Tim fired from behind and off to Rick's side, one of his bullets tore through his partner's shoulder. After the gunshots thundered and the sow fell, the grim tally was one dead grizzly bear and one wounded hunter. Rick's wounds were not lethal, but were serious. 
The bullet fired by his partner entered through the rear of his shoulder, rendering his arm limited in its use. During the raucous shooting, the cub had disappeared and likely sought refuge up a nearby tree or in a clump of brush. Tim and Rick immediately examined the wound in Rick's shoulder and tried to stop the bleeding as much as possible. They made their way out to their vehicle and got Rick to medical help for treatment of the wound. After being notified of the incident, the Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks wardens began investigating the incident immediately. The sow's carcass was taken for analysis to gather information and confirm the hunter's account of the run-in with the sow and her cub. The grizzly killed during the attack was determined to be a 25-year-old female, which is very old for a sow with cubs. She had no history of conflict with people before this incident and was tagged in 2009 as part of a population survey on grizzlies in the area. Officials immediately began monitoring the location in search of the cub, but I could find no source pertaining to the failure or success of finding it. Depending on its age, the cub may have survived on its own. If it was a cub from the prior spring, it would likely die due to starvation or predation by a boar grizzly bear. After the investigation by the FWP's Wildlife Human Attack Response Team, the sow's behavior was deemed defensive due to the presence of her cub and the lack of conflict with people. Had she not been killed during the attack, she likely would have been left alone, even if she had mauled the hunters due to the circumstances involved in the attack. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I'm left with a few questions for you. Do you think this attack could have been avoided had the hunters found a route with better visibility? How did the hunters get so close to the grizzly and her cub without being detected? Would bear spray have prevented this attack? Do you think the cub found a way to survive? I hope so. I'll be glad to read and respond to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to Henry's Lake, Idaho, just 20 miles from the western border of Yellowstone National Park. The terrain here are high mountains interrupted by grassy meadows with elevations between 6,500 and 8,000 feet high. The tall forests here are a combination of pine, fir, and spruce trees mingled with stands of quaking aspen. Wild berries like serviceberry, thimbleberry, huckleberry, and golden currant fill in a dense undergrowth and provide shelter and food for animals and humans alike. The winters here are cold and snowy, with an average temperature of well below freezing, even during the daytime. Each month of winter averages about three inches of snowfall, which can add up to a foot or more near the end of the season. Given its proximity to Yellowstone National Park, you can expect to see moose, mule deer, elk, and pronghorn antelope browsing the meadow edges. The predators of this area include cougars, wolves, coyotes, black bears, and an increasing and spreading population of grizzly bears. Fall is a busy time for people in this area. Locals and visitors pack the mountains in search of game, beginning in late August with archery hunters, then rifle hunters at the beginning of October. Recreation is a key economic driver for communities here, as hunting, fishing, snowmobiling, and hiking draw visitors from around the world to this area. Fall is also a busy time for bears. Black bears and grizzlies are in hyperphagia, which is a metabolic state that increases their drive to find food. Bears will cover miles and miles each day, looking for extra calories that will build their fat reserves needed for hibernation, and may cause them to deviate from predictable patterns to do so. Just northwest of Henry's Lake is a small cluster of mountains called the Henry's Lake or Lion's Head Mountains, which are part of the Caribou Targhee National Forest. There are many roads between this area and the national park, which conservationists say limit wildlife travel between ecosystems, but apparently grizzlies didn't get the memo. On the evening of September 30th, 2023, two elk hunters were sneaking through the timber in search of the elusive and secretive ungulates. For the sake of this episode, we'll refer to them as Mike and Steve, as their actual identities have not been released to the public. Mike and Steve have formulated a plan to stock a stand of dark timber and determine the route each of them would plan to travel. They would make sure to be near each other, but far enough apart that elk would find it more difficult to circle around them in the timber. Elk that detect a human scent on the breeze will frequently tiptoe around them while using the breeze to their advantage, and can do this making very little detectable noise. I've had this happen to me many times while stalking elk in central Idaho. As Steve and Mike split up, they carried their hunting equipment as well as a sidearm, but did not pack bear spray. Mike headed along his planned route, and Steve was a little further around the hill, and traveling a route that roughly paralleled Mike's. The plan was to meet up at the end of the stalk, 
or back at camp to discuss the information gathered during the stalk if neither man was successful at getting a shot or harvesting an elk. As Steve sneaked through the shadows of the dark timber, he scanned each bush and tree for telltale signs of elk. An outline of an ear or the white fur on their rump are sometimes all the evidence the animals will provide as they secret themselves among the bushes. Knowing the habits of game animals is the key to successfully harvesting them. The hunters knew that in the evening the elk would be headed downhill to a water source to fill up after sleeping the day away in shaded beds higher on the mountains. While searching for a sign of elk in the area, Steve examined the trails for tracks and wallows for recent proof of their activity. He decided to continue on his route to the dark timber on the north side of the slope and began working his way toward that location. The brush on the northern slope of most mountains and hills here is more dense than on southern exposures due to longer-lasting accumulations of precipitation. Steve pushed his way through tangles of brush and over dead fall logs while keeping his eyes scanning for scant detail. As Steve crept along, a rustling in the bushes a short distance away caught his attention. He was probably hoping a nice-sized bull elk would emerge and present a broadside shot. But what blurred from the cover was a large sow grizzly and she wasn't happy to find a human being so close to her, so unexpectedly. Now a little bit about grizzlies and their speed is in order to understand Steve's predicament. They can sprint at over 40 miles an hour, which translates into 44 feet per second. This distance is roughly equal to 15 yards, which means the sow emerging at only 100 feet would be upon Steve in about 2.5 seconds. That isn't much time to consider whether her charge is a bluff or a full-on attack. As soon as Steve's mind could process the bear's presence, he yelled out to Mike to make sure he knew the grizzly was close. That was all it took for the sow to initiate her attack on him. She began advancing toward him, as his hand was already reaching toward his pistol in its holster. The sources I could find regarding this incident did not indicate what caliber, make, or model of firearm Steve was carrying. I would only assume, by the outcome, that it had to be at least a forty caliber, as a smaller firearm probably would have only injured the grizzly, increasing her aggression and not stopping her. Steve could see the grizzly stretching out her paws with each bound, bringing her dangerously close to him with each one. In a split second, he unholstered his pistol and let fly several shots, each striking the sow as she advanced toward him. By the time the gunshots stopped echoing down the valley, the sow had piled up only a few yards from Steve. He was shaken by the speed at which the sow closed the distance between them, but relieved that her progress was stopped by his focused and proficient use of his sidearm. Steve immediately knew that his elk hunt was over, at least for the time being. The hunters made their way back toward civilization to find a phone. They contacted the Idaho Citizens Against Poaching Group, which is an organization of Idaho citizens focused on preventing or apprehending wildlife poachers. CAP responders contacted the Idaho Fish and Game, who sent an investigative team to the attack site. They conducted a thorough investigation, utilizing the information provided by Steve, as well as the forensic evidence, like bear and human tracks, shell casings, and entry wounds on the grizzly's carcass. They determined that the angle of the entry wounds verified Steve's portrayal of things, and decided that he had acted in self-defense. This is an interesting point, because they also indicated that the sow was acting in self-defense when reacting to the man's presence. During this incident, Mike and Steve were uninjured, and the sow grizzly was obviously killed. There was no source indicating that the sow was defending a cached food source, and didn't state that there were cubs present at the time. It appeared that the sow was simply reacting to a human being too close, that apparently made her feel threatened. As a hunter, I go into the woods as prepared as I can for a confrontation with a hungry or aggressive predator. I think it is safe to assume that Mike and Steve did the same. If it weren't for Steve's quick reactions in defending himself, he may have been the victim of a bear attack. He may have sustained serious injuries or death at the paws, claws, and teeth of one of the world's most powerful predators. Authorities issued a statement encouraging hunters to carry bear spray, hunt in groups, watch for bear sign like tracks, scat, and digging. Hunters should remove their meat as fast as possible and hang it, as well as trash and food, at least 200 yards from their camp and at least 10 feet off the ground. They also advise that hunters make noise around creeks and streams, as the babbling of the water can drown out their approach. It seems like Steve and Mike followed these guidelines for the most part, which may have prevented a more serious and injurious attack. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I have a few questions for you. Do you think bear spray would have been effective to avoid this attack, or did it happen too fast? Do you think Steve should have waited to see if the grizzly sow was bluffing before firing his pistol? 
Why do you think Steve and the Grizzly ended up surprising each other? Was she napping when he approached? What would you have done if you found yourself in Steve's position and were being charged by an enormous Grizzly from close range? I'll be glad to read and respond to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Welcome back to Scary Bear Attacks. Today's episode takes us to Aspen Snowmass Ski Resort in Aspen, Colorado. This is the heart of the Rocky Mountains, and they are at their most majestic in this area. The granite peaks jet over 14,000 feet in elevation and push back the starry host on crisp fall nights. The tall forests of pine, fir, and spruce accommodate large patches of quaking aspen trees, which turn gold in autumn's jubilee. This patchwork of color and slope is the medium of Mother Nature at her most artistic. The elk, deer, and moose mosey through greenery and trim any plants like furry gardeners equipped with primitive tools. The predators here include stealthy cougars, comical coyotes, bodacious bobcats, and bedeviled black bear boars. On the evening of October 23, 2023, a security guard, whom we will refer to as Jack, was performing his perfunctory duties. On any given night, Jack may be called to confront loud hotel guests or escort unauthorized visitors from the St. Regis Aspen Resort. This job had its exciting moments, but for the most part, was relatively easy. The luxury hotel had recently been closed for renovations and historically is a hub for the rich and famous frequenting the town of Aspen. It's positioned right at the base of the ski resort and draws visitors with finer tastes, with its kitchen serving delicious fare. Aspen is an interesting town nestled among the high ridge of Rocky Mountains about 100 miles west of Denver. Although the big city sprawls and bustles with towering buildings and honking horns, Aspen is quite the opposite. The mountains around the town rise inside the city limits and surround it like a crumpled emerald blanket. Unlike other blankets, this one may not bring warmth, safety, and rest, but unexpected visitors who do surprising and harmful things. On this evening, Jack was in the process of marking off his list of procedures that he performed each night. The quiet hotel was eerie and offered him the expectation of a boring and slow shift. Just after 11 p.m., Jack received a call over his radio regarding something very unusual. The static-filled voice over the radio mentioned something about a black bear being seen near the kitchen area of the restaurant. He probably thought the bear had just been seen peeking into a door and had left on its own. I imagine he thought it was a curious cub or a juvenile and could easily be driven off by a little yelling and clapping of his hands. Jack wasn't equipped with a firearm as a security officer, as his first response to a crisis would have been to call the police after investigating it himself. He wasn't equipped with bear spray, as he was working in a hotel and not a mountain meadow. As Jack warily walked toward the kitchen, he gripped the only self-defense tool he had access to, his radio. Now, if you know anything about bear attacks, the most important information is what the victim doesn't know. Jack wasn't aware that a rather large black bear, estimated to be at least 350 pounds, had been drawn to the courtyard of the hotel. The scent of food and garbage was released into the evening air by doors propped open during renovations, doors that would have normally been closed. Jack was unaware that this hungry black bear had found a way into the kitchen and had already begun wandering the hallways in search of food. Jack left the security room as soon as the bear's presence was reported. He carefully watched well ahead of him to see if he could locate the bear as he approached the kitchen. Taking the corners widely allowed him to see further down the hallways and into rooms as he examined the floor for muddy paw prints. Now this bear attack was caught on video by the hotel's closed-circuit cameras. I've posted a link to this video on my Patreon account, which is linked below. If you'd like to check it out, it's pretty interesting and actually shows what is described below. Given it is the video of the attack, it wouldn't pass YouTube guidelines, so it wasn't included as part of this video. As Jack approached a hallway, he could see the footprints of a bear on the tile floor. The prints clearly went one way down the hall, then came back along the same path. The problem was figuring out if the bear was coming or going, and just where it had ended up. Jack proceeded from a prep room into a dishwashing room and glanced around. He didn't see the bear, and probably hoped he wouldn't see it. His eyes strained to search the shadows for a dark shape, but nothing materialized. Jack walked down a small hallway to enter another room, and just as he rounded a corner, he ran face to face with a short but very stout black bear. The light from the room behind Jack illuminated the face of the bear as it dashed toward him. 
As the bear quickly stood to its hind legs, Jack could see a beautiful hourglass-shaped patch of white fur in the middle of its chest. His mind processed mere fractions of a second like minutes. As he watched the right paw of the bruiser reach out toward him, Jack spun away to his left and back toward the door he came through. His mind may have been working faster than time passing, but his body was still bound by the laws of physics, matter, and energy, and there was simply no way he could escape the amount of energy the matter of the bear's paws was reaching out to impart upon him. As Jack spun to flee, the bear's massive right paw was heading toward him at a much faster and more powerful pace. The paw may have been intended for Jack's head, but where it struck him was along the right side of his back. In a blindingly quick swat, the black bear imparted enough force on Jack to send him flying over ten feet across the kitchen floor, while completely tattering his suit jacket, shirt, and undershirt. The bear's claws cut through the flesh of Jack's back, leaving five distinct gashes, as well as a bear paw-shaped bruise. As Jack slid on his stomach across the kitchen floor, he clearly expected to receive follow-up bites, swats, and claw gashes. He lay prone and still for a split second, waiting to determine where he needed to defend from the bear's attack. In the CCTV footage, you can see the confusion and expectation of the bear on Jack's expression. The bear stood up on its hind legs while staring toward the human who had so suddenly materialized in front of him as he rounded the kitchen corner. Then the bear glanced back into the dark room behind it and disappeared into the safety of cover and distance. Once Jack realized the bear was not going to pounce on him to continue its attack, he pushed himself back to his feet and sprinted away from the kitchen area and that black bear that had so suddenly materialized in front of him as he rounded the kitchen corner. Jack immediately pressed the button on his radio and confirmed that there was definitely a large black bear in the kitchen area. The adrenaline of the Blitzkrieg bear attack had dulled the pain from the gashes of the bear's claws. It was now starting to wear off a bit, and Jack knew he would need medical attention to help stave off infection. He used his cell phone to reach out for an ambulance to take him to medical help. I could find no summary of the medical assistance or a number of sutures or stitches required to close Jack's wounds. The information indicated that Jack was released the next day after an overnight stay for observation in the hospital. Typical medical treatment after a bear attack is a heavy dose of antibiotics to fend off the infections, as well as stitches to close the layers of flesh penetrated by the bear's teeth and claws. The Colorado Parks and Wildlife Agency responded to the reports of Jack's run-in with the black bear just after it had occurred around 11 p.m. Monday night. They sent out a response team to the location, and while en route, the team observed eight black bears walking the streets of Aspen headed toward downtown. The response team arrived at the hotel just after midnight and immediately began scouring the area in search of the bear. They had a fairly unique description of the bear based on the hourglass-shaped patch of white fur on its chest. Its short but robust build also allowed the officers to eliminate other visiting black bears from their list of potential hotel kitchen invaders. Once they located the bear that fit the description, they were equipped and ready to tranquilize the bear. The problem with doing so in this location and time was that they were undermanned. They were concerned that they may lose the bear in the darkness and not be able to remove it. They decided to wait and return the next day to try again. On Tuesday evening, the officers returned to where they last saw the bear. This time, the game officers recruited the assistance of the Aspen Police Department as well as the Pitkin County Sheriff's Office. The search party found the bear in Connor Park, near East Hopkins Avenue. After giving the bear the once-over to make sure he fit the description, they hazed the bear into a tree. A professionally aimed dart filled with tranquilizer put the bear to sleep, and it was recovered from the tree via a ladder on an Aspen fire truck, just after 2 a.m. on Wednesday morning, October 25, 2023. Colorado Parks and Wildlife determined the bear to be a nuisance bear. Typically, bears in the area are allowed two strikes before being euthanized, but this bear's boldness and lack of fear of human beings in their dwellings was enough for them to decide to euthanize it. The large black bear was humanely put to sleep by CPW officers, and its carcass was taken for analysis. Following this incident, CPW issued a public warning encouraging residents to be bear aware. This statement is glaringly ironic given the incident occurred within a hotel kitchen, not a mountain trail. After reviewing the facts surrounding this episode, I have a few questions for you. Given there were eight black bears observed by officials the same night they were responding to a bear attack inside a hotel, what do you think needs to happen to make Aspen Street safer from bear attacks? How do you think this bear attack could have been avoided? In what ways could it have been worse? Can you describe a face-to-face -face encounter with a hungry black bear at your job? 
I will be glad to read and respond to your thoughts, so please post them in the comments section below, and let's talk about it. Thank you for watching Scary Bear Attacks. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider clicking on the like button and clicking on the bell icon. It will help you know when we post our new episodes. Posting our video links to your social media profiles furthers awareness, and it's fun. We slashed our prices in our merch store, linked below. So check out the bargains there while you shop. As a member of our human community, remember to adventure bravely and be careful out there, especially in bear country.